the Jews. The Jews are composed of three or four separate racial elements. The Asiatic Negroid strain shows itself occasionally with the curly hair, the long eye, and proportions of the skull. The Jewish hybrids with the Negro in Jamaica and Guana reproduce most strikingly the Assyrian type. You see, Jews were called Negro, which is the Spanish and Portuguese word for black. Both Spanish and Portuguese Jews were called black Jews. For example, in this quote it reads, King John II in 1492 expelled all the Jews to the island of St. Thomas, which had been discovered in 1471, and to other Portuguese settlements on the continent of Africa. And from these banished Jews, the black Portuguese, as they are called. It reads, thus the black color is found not only in individuals as the black Jews of Portugal. And it reads, "'Tis also a vulgar error that the Jews are all black, for this is only true of the Portuguese Jews, who marrying always among one another, beget children like themselves. And consequently, the swarthiness of their complexion is entailed upon their whole race, even in the northern regions." Now notice how first-hand accounts line up with Bible verses such as Lamentations chapter 5 verse 10 where it reads, Our skin is black like an oven because of the terrible famine. Now not only did Europeans refer to the Jews as black, Arabs also referred to the Jews as black. Now the Arab word for black is referred to as Sudan. S-U-D-A-N. The following references read, the Arabic word for blacks is Sudan. And then the reference at the bottom reads, they call it Balad Sudan, which means land of the blacks. Sudan is the Arabic word for black person. Now notice that Sudan is spelled two different ways. S-U-D-A-N is the modern day spelling. However, the antiquity spelling was S-O-U-D-A-N, so you dan which is simply two words combined into one, so you dan Now, let's use Google Translate to look up the meaning of the words so you dan Now, we will use Hausa language, which is located in the So Yudan, to translate the word Yudan.
Now, let's take a quick look at the Hebrew meaning of the words soul, Yudan. After all, Hebrew is the native tongue of the Jews. To do this, we will start with Strong's Concordance, H5471. That's Strong's word, H5471, which is so. And if we look at the definition of the word so, it reads, of foreign origin. That's of foreign origin. And if we put that together, we look at the Hebrew translation. So means foreigner or of foreign origin. And Yudan equals Judah, which is H3063, which represents the southern kingdom. And if you put the two together, you get foreigners of Judah. So on our map, we have So Yudan, which in Hebrew represents the foreigners of Judah. Now, let's cross-check our Google Translation findings using additional references. For example, the index in the back of the Talmud, Volume 3, reads, Yudan, a variant of Judah in the 4th century. And our next reference reads, Yudan equals Judah. Now, let's take a look at additional references to see exactly who lived in the soul Yudan. The Jews. The Jews of soul Yudan are, according to my informers, divided into many large and small tribes, with whose names they are unacquainted. Their mode of life in some countries is pastoral. But the towns are filled with traders and artificers of that faith who gain a substance at their several employments in the service of the Muslims, under whose government they live as vassals. This in reference to Mr. Bodwich's kingdom of Yehudi. I may be permitted to say is the only state of society in which that oppressed nation is suffered to live and the tribes without security in their possessions without public revenue or arms are hourly exposed to insult and rampant form of blind zeal and act of bigotry by which their lords are animated in those countries the lands occupied by those people cover a wide extent between Messina and Cadi they are said to be mingled also with the upper Fula tribes eastward of Timbuktu and in many parts of Moro, they have inheritance or are employed as artificers in the cities and towns. As we live among the heathens, says Bashar, so do the Jews in Moroa and Fulani with our brethren, but they are not esteemed like us, for they are a people hardened in their sins and obstinance in their fidelity. The anger of Yah is upon them, and therefore are they given to the rule of the Muslims. The Arab Bashar goes on to describe the Jews as brown color instead of the black color of the Ashanti. The Arabic word so Yudan and the word Negro, which is the Portuguese and Spanish word for black, were bywords that were used to describe the Jews or the house or tribe of Judah. Now, this was foretold in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 37, where it reads, And thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a by word, among all nations, whether Yah shall lead thee. Now, we will discuss another by word for the Jews or for the house of Judah. It's one of the more controversial by words. It's a by word that today causes hurt and pain and often great sadness. However, this controversial by word can be used to identify the true identity 
of the so-called African American today. The byword is spelled N-I-G-G-E-R. It was a byword used to identify slaves that were captured in the Niger Delta region. However, Niger is a relatively modern pronunciation of the word. During the time of antiquity, it was pronounced nigger. Now, the New World Encyclopedia tells us that the Portuguese arrived at the Niger Delta on the coast in 1473. By the 17th century, coastal trade had supplanted the Trans-Saharan trade, mostly dealing in slaves. During the years when the slave trade flourished, nearly half the total number of slaves exported from Africa came from the Niger Delta, which came to be known as the Slave Coast. Next, let's read about the people that were taken as slaves who lived in the Niger River region. This next reference comes from John Ogilby of London who was the official cosmographer and geographic printer of King Charles. And it reads, Many Jews also are scattered over this region, some natives boasting themselves of Abraham's seed, inhabiting both sides of the river Niger. Others are Asian strangers who fled thither either from the desolation of Jerusalem by Vespasian or from Judea wasted and depopulated by the Romans, Persians, Sarsians, and Christians, or else such came out of Europe, whence they were banished out of parts of Italy in the year 1342 out of Spain in the year 1462, out of the Low Countries in 1350, out of France in 1403, out of England in 1422. These all differ in habit and are divided into several tribes, having no dominion though both wealthy and numerous, but despised of all nations and so abominated by the Turks that they are not permitted to be Mohammedans unless first baptized and then no otherwise made use of than to receive their customs and to gather their taxes. Skipping to the bottom paragraph it reads the idolaters are numerous in Negro land upper and lower Ethiopia and towards the great ocean except as we hinted before some few who by the industry of the Portuguese and the Spain have been converted and baptized in several places. In case you're wondering, who are these black Jews living in the Nigger River Delta region on the west coast of Africa? We need look no further than another book authorized by the official cosmographer and geographic printer of King Charles himself. This comes from a book called America, An Accurate Description of the New World by John Ogilvy. On page 574, it reads that John III, King of Portugal, sent a colony thither above 200 years before, whom though the unwholesome air destroyed, yet the place was not left desolate for he sent new inhabitants who first settled Guinea, next in Angola, and lastly on the island of St. Thomas, that so they might be better used to the air, that the said king sold all those Jews for slaves that refused to embrace the Roman religion and caused their children to be baptized from whom coming thither in great numbers most of the present inhabitants were descended. So according to John Ogilvy of London, the children of the Jews that refused to embrace the Roman religion 
were placed on the west coast of Africa in great numbers, most of which the present inhabitants were descended. In being baptized, a mark was placed on their hands and on their foreheads. As we read, the cardinals that was to obfuscate being come with the canons of that church. The ceremony was begun with blessing the water. After the proselytes presented by their godfathers advanced everyone in his turn and declared their desire to be baptized. Then they leaned over the front. The cardinal baptized them, pouring water on their foreheads out of a large silver spoon and gave them their names. According to the cosmographer and geographic printer of the king, along with additional references, the black Portuguese and Spanish Jews were placed on the west coast of Africa in great numbers. Now, let's look at additional references to see why the Jews were placed on the west coast of Africa. The Jews and Moors in Spain, page 214, and it reads, The king's creed awoke again simultaneously with the reawakening of his greed. He issued an edict which threw even that of Torquemada in the shade. All Jewish children below 14 years of age were torn from their parents' arms, dragged into the church, baptized. Those under three years of age were given to Christians to receive a Christian education or in other words to be raised as slaves. Those between three and ten years of age were put on board of a ship conveyed to the newly discovered unwholesome island of St. Thomas called the Isles of Perdition which was colonized by Portuguese condemned criminals or Portuguese Jews condemned by the Inquisition to fare there as best they could. Those between 10 and 14 years were sold as slaves. Then indeed the cup of their affliction was full to the brim. It was a stern truth in which Lemieux uttered when he said, the Jews have experienced fully the unequal skill of the church in administering pain. Mothers cast themselves at the feet of the tyrants and pitifully begged to be taken with their babies. They were heartlessly thrust aside. Hundreds of mothers, mad with despair, ran behind the ships as they carried off the idols of their heart and perished in the waves. The serene fortitude which the exiled people had borne so many and such grievous calamities gave way at last and was replaced by the wildest paroxysms of despair. Piercing shrieks of anguish filled the land, childless and heartbroken and brokenhearted. They now sought to leave the land, but they were told that they had forfeited their right and they were given the choice between baptism and slavery. Thousands after enduring all that they did, after leaving the beloved Spain and all their wealth and ease submitted to baptism now in the hope of being reunited with their children. Thousands were sold as slaves. Yet prior to being sold, they were submitted to tortures, cruelties, outrageous to revolting, too repulsive, too heartrending to be here narrated. Now to pause here just for a moment, just keep in mind that these were black Portuguese and Spanish Jews 
as the previous references have pointed out. All right, as we continue, terror seized upon the native Portuguese Jews when they helplessly beheld the cruelties to which their Spanish brethren were subjected. They knew then themselves could not escape the wrath of the church much longer. They thought of flight, and well had it been for them had they made their escape then. While they were making secret preparations, John II died, 1495. He had been afflicted on the very day when the ships laden with the Jewish exile children set sail for the isle of the condemned criminals with a strange painful malady and had lingered ever since so king john ii who shipped the children of the jews to the west coast of africa became sick the very day that the ships departed from portugal let's keep reading it says his own promising son and successor preceded him into the grave. His cousin Manuel ascended the throne. He was the counterpart of his predecessor, kind-hearted, a promoter of learning, eager to further the interests of his country by discoveries abroad and by commerce at home. Immediately he disenfranchised the Jewish exiles sold into slavery promised to recall the condemned children, and issued an edict in which he commanded kind treatment to the Jews and prohibited accusations against them. In their great joy, the native Portuguese Jews sent an embassy to him, offering him large sums of money, voluntarily, as a token of their gratitude. The king thanked them, reassured them of his goodwill, but refused to be paid for human kindness. But again had destiny decreed that a woman was to play an ignoble part in the tragic history of the Jews. A marriage was proposed between Manuel of Portugal and the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabel of Spain. Manuel was rejoiced with the proposal. Already he saw himself in the near future king of United Spain and Portugal and of the entire new world. But Satan stepped between, dipped his pen in gall, and writing the marriage contract, demanded as one of the conditions the immediate expulsion from Portugal of all the Jews, both natives, which is the Portuguese, and exiles, which were the Spanish. The king hesitated. The fanatical daughter of the fanatical parents persisted. Argument made her more vehement. Torquemada might as well be proud of his pupil. The possession of vast empires and of the most powerful crown of Europe tempted and the temper conquered. He had purchased his right to the princess of Spain at a sacrifice of thousands and thousands of lives and with the destruction of the very pillars of his nation's prosperity. On the 30th of November, 1497, the marriage contract was signed. And on the 20th of the following month appeared the edict of the expulsion of the Jews from Portugal. The scene of mourning and wailing, heart-rending cries which resounded in Spain re-echoed in Portugal, only the more painful because of the terrible knowledge that they had since acquired of the meaning of the word, expulsion. Manuel soon regretted his signing away his most industrious, most intelligent, and most prosperous citizens. But the marriage contract held him fast, and the Spanish queen kept a watchful eye on him and Torquemada upon both the prospective vast empire and Spanish crown still dazzled his eyes. He planned a strategy. He thought he could force the parents to embrace Christianity and to remain if he once succeeded in getting all their children into his power and into the Christian faith. He gave secret orders for the repetition of the atrocious crime of having all children 
under 14 years of age seized from their mother's bosom and father's arm, dispersed through the kingdom to be baptized and brought up as Christians. The secret became known. Portugal again re-echoed the wails of stricken ones. Frantic mothers threw their children into deep wells or rivers. Mothers were known to take their babies from their breasts and tear them limb from limb. Rather than resign them to Christians, they would rather know the bodies of their children in the grave and their released spirit in heaven than have them adopt a faith into which Satan sent his friends. With all the parents' opposition, the king's order was executed. Many accepted baptism, but not enough to please the king, and to wreak vengeance upon them for thwarting his wishes, he revoked his edict, seized all who had not yet fed, and sold them for slaves. What happened to the children? What happened to the children? What became of the children of these rebellious Jews that refused to embrace the Roman religion? What became of the children of the Jews that sacrificed their lives and in some cases their children to make a stand for the laws, statutes, and commandments and their belief in the Most High? What became of those children? In order to answer this question, we need to look no further than the ones who enslaved the children themselves. But we first need to understand that the Jews of Spain and Portugal claim their descent from the tribe of Judah. As the following reference reads, it says, the Spanish and the Portuguese Jews claim their descent from the tribe of Judah. And with that in mind, the slavers who took the children and carried the children to the west coast of Africa named the place that they sent the children after the children. On the west coast of Africa, the Portuguese slavers named the slave coast the kingdom of Judah. And the next reference also confirms that the children that were taken to the west coast of Africa resided in the kingdom of Judah. As the following quote reads, it reads, Wida or Judah or a Judah is a city old, frequented since the 16th century by the Portuguese slavers who gave it its name. Its inhabitants were said to be Judaic, and they were indeed considered as a remnant of the scattered tribes of Israel. And the next quote reads, East of the Great Popo begins the Dahomey territory, guarded by the important town of Gliwich, known to Europeans by various names of Fida, Huweda, Wida, Wida. The old writers called it Judah, and its inhabitants were said to be Jews, while the neighboring river, Alala, whose real name was Ephraim, during the flourishing days of the slave coast, from 16 to 18,000 were annually transported from Judah. As the Portuguese 
call this place. All right, so let's do a brief recap of what we've learned so far. We learned that the Portuguese shipped the children of the rebellious house of Judah, or the tribe of Judah, who refused to embrace the Roman religion. These children were sent or shipped to the west coast of Africa in great numbers. We also learned that the Portuguese named the place that they sent the children of the house or tribe of Judah to. These Portuguese named the place after the children. They named the place the kingdom of Judah. And we also learned that these children were raised to be Christians and to be slaves. Now, let's cross check our findings using additional References. Now, previous references show the king of Portugal taking all the children of the rebellious house or tribe of Judah from the ages of 14 years of age and younger to be raised as Christians and slaves. However, additional references show this age was later increased to children in their 20s. For example, in this reference, the Jews of Spain and Portugal and the Inquisition, it reads, a fresh edict went forth that all the children between the ages of 14 and 20 should also be taken from their parents and baptized. And multitudes were dragged forcibly by their hair and by their arms into the churches and compelled to receive the waters of baptism together with new names being afterwards given over to those who undertook to instruct them in the Christian faith. Now, let's check the transatlantic slave trade database, which contains almost 36,000 slaving voyages on record. We will use its database of roughly 96,000 slave entries to review the ages of Jews enslaved. Let's see if these slaves were middle-aged men and women in their 30s and 40s, as often seen in modern-day portrayals of this transatlantic slave trade. Or let's see if there was something more sinister in the cargo of these slave ships. According to the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database, the number of slaves above the age of 30 was only 6 to 7 percent. Roughly 6 to 7 percent of slaves were above the age of 30. This means that roughly 94 to 93 percent of those on the transatlantic slave ships were younger than 30 years old. Closer inspection shows a disturbing truth of those that were on the ships. And Bible scripture specifically foretold that the children of Israel would go into captivity because Israel abandoned Yah's laws, statutes, and commandments. Of the 93 to 94% of those that were under 30 years of age, 2% were babies and toddlers. 27% were of elementary school age, and roughly 16% were of high school age. And of those on the transatlantic slave ships, roughly 21% were of college age. And lastly, 28% were young adults in their mid to upper 20s. 
And this was foretold in the scriptures as far as the children going into captivity. Deuteronomy 28 verse 32 reads, Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people, and thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long. And there shall be no might in thine hand. Deuteronomy 28 verse 41 reads, Thou shalt beget sons and daughters, but thou shalt not enjoy them, for they shall go into captivity. Verse 6 reads, The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians, that ye might remove them far from their border. It was foretold that they would be forcefully removed from their borders in Joel 3, and that Judah would be scattered throughout the world. Deuteronomy 28 verse 64 reads, And Yah shall scatter thee among all people, from one end of the earth even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. Now, According to the scriptures, the children of Judah were scattered across the four corners of the earth into slavery. And as the references stated time and time again, they were to be raised as Christians and slaves. As the following references confirm, the top references read, to receive a Christian education, or in other words, to be raised as slaves or our next reference at the bottom reads sold all those jews for slaves that refused to embrace the roman religion and caused their children to be baptized and this is the the baptism into christianity and it says from whom these children coming thither which is the west coast of africa in great numbers most of the present inhabitants were descended now the children of the rebellious house of judah who refused to embrace the roman religion were raised in the christian doctrine these slaves shipped to the new world learned the principles of their new faith from their masters as the following quote reads it reads, we had the best mistress and master in the world. They was Christian folk, and they taught us to be Christian-like too. Every Sunday morning, old master would have all us to the house while he would sing and pray and read the Bible to us all. Old master taught us not to be bad. He taught us to be good. He taught us to never steal or nor to tell false tales and not to do anything that was bad he said you will reap what you sow and that you sow it single and reap it double i learned that when i was a little child and i ain't forget it yet when i got grown i went the baptist way god called my papa to preach oh master let him preach in the kitchen and in the backyard under the trees on preaching day old master took his whole family and all the slaves to church with him. now in addition to learning to never steal and to never tell false tales they were also taught that the laws statutes and commandments of the most high were done away with they were also taught new holy days and to disregard the holy days of the Bible. And they were also taught that they were the descendants of Ham, which is Gentiles, 
instead of being the children of Israel. The next reference reads, Pope Pius V, by nature a sinister ecclesiastic, delighting in persecution, who treated Jews as the cursed children of Ham, was succeeded by Gregory VIII, who had been skillfully trained to fanaticism by the Jesuits and Thirteen monks. As regard Jews, Gregory was a most consistent follower of the cruelty of his predecessor. In summary, the children received a Roman makeover, courtesy of the Pope, the one who calls himself the Vicar of Christ, which means the replacement of Christ, whose name equals 666, which is the number of Satan. They caused the children of Judah to embrace the very religion their forefathers died and often made great sacrifice opposing. Now, you may wonder, what is the difference between these new Roman Christian Jews and the Israelites of old? Well, let's take a closer look. Not only did writers know that the children of the rebellious house of Judah 
were sent into slavery and were scattered to the four corners of the earth. They also knew who held the children of Judah captive. And for that, let's read a quick reference from modern Judaism from a book that was written in the 1800s. And it reads, first, that the descendants of Esau, the sworn enemies of the descendants of Jacob, even to the end of the world, were at first a small nation inhabiting Mount Seir and the adjacent country, contiguous to the land of Canaan, that they were easily confined within their own limits, as long as the Israelites enjoyed a great and formidable empire in Canaan. But that after the powerful republic of the twelve tribes was destroyed by the Assyrians and the Babylonians, they wonderfully increased in numbers and strength, extended their dominion towards the west, spread their colonies far and wide, subjugated Italy, founded Rome and the Roman Empire, at length entirely overturned the Jewish state, which had been restored after the termination of the Babylonian captivity. The second temple being destroyed by Titus Vespasian, and that in the present day, professing the religion of Jesus of Nazareth, which they were the first of all nations to embrace. They hold the dominion over all Europe. Esau detaining in captivity his brother, Jacob, at least as far as regards the tribe of Judah, till his Messiah, Ben David or Yahshua, shall appear. So during the time of the 1800s, these writers wrote that the descendants of Esau detained in captivity his brother Jacob, at least as far as regards the tribe of Judah. And just to read a little bit more, it reads, Secondly, that the prophecies of the prophets against Esau, Edom, Seir, and the cities of Edom, especially those of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Obadiah, have not yet received their full accomplishment, for that thou, the house of Esau, has experienced some particular judgments of God on account of the injuries at different periods of time and afflicted upon Israel. Yet, the final vengeance on account of that last and greatest injury, the destruction of the second temple by Titus, and, listen, the transportation of the Jews into captivity in which they are still most opprobriously detained is yet impending over it to be executed in the time of the Messiah. All right. Well, as you can see, this reference points to the Jews being in captivity to Esau. And according to the scriptures that they would remain in captivity or in the land of their captivity until the Messiah returns. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 10. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith Yah, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. Now as a whole, there's really only one people on the face of the earth that as a people still live in the land that they once served as captives. And it is the same people that were scattered across the four corners of the earth via the transatlantic slave trade. And it is also the same people that were placed on the west coast of Africa in great numbers by the expulsion edicts and by the inquisition. All right, so let's keep reading. It says, I will save thee from afar and thy seed, your children, from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return and shall be in rest and be quiet and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, saith Yah, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations whether I have scattered thee, yet 
will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure, and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. For thus saith Yah, Thy bruise is incurable, and thy wound is grievous. There is none that plead thy cause, that thou mayest be bound up, that has no healing medicines. All thy lovers have forgotten thee, they seek thee not. For I have wounded thee with the wound of an enemy, with the chastisement of a cruel one. For the multitude of thine iniquity, or the word iniquity means lawlessness, so it means for the multitude of thine lawlessness, because of thy sins, breaking of the commandments, which sins were increased. Let's read that again. It says, for the multitude of thine lawlessness, because thy sins were increased. Verse 15 reads, Why criest thou for thine affliction? Thy sorrow is incurable for the multitude of thine lawlessness. Because thy sins were increased, I have done these things unto thee. Therefore, all they that devour thee shall be devoured. All thine adversaries, every one of them, shall go into captivity. And they that spoil thee, shall be a spoil and all they that prey upon thee will I give for prey for I will restore health unto thee I will heal thee of thy wounds saith Yah because they call thee an outcast saying Yah this is Zion whom no man seeketh after thus saith Yah behold I will bring again the captivity of Jacob's tent or the freedom and have mercy on his dwellings and the city shall be built upon her own heap, and the place and the palace shall remain after the manner thereof. And out of them shall proceed thanksgiving, and the voice of them that make merry. I will multiply them, and they shall not be few. I will also glorify them, they shall not be small. Their children also shall be as aforetime, and their congregation shall be established before me and i will punish all that oppress them and their nobles shall be of themselves and their governor shall proceed from the midst of them and i will cause him to draw near and he shall approach unto me and who is this that engaged his heart to approach me saith yah and you shall be my people and I will be your Elohim. Behold, the whirlwind of Yah goeth forth with fury, a continuing whirlwind. It shall fall with pain upon the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of Yah shall not return until he have done it, and until he have performed the intents of his heart. In the latter days, you shall consider. All right, well, we've reached the end of Hidden Hebrews Part 2, and hopefully you've learned a lot. Hopefully you've learned, according to first-hand accounts, that it was the Jews of the tribe of Judah, or the house of Judah, their children were placed on the west coast of Africa in great numbers because their parents refused to embrace the Roman religion. And these children were to be raised as Christians and as slaves. And through the transatlantic slave trade, these children were shipped to the four corners of the earth. And that to this day, they live in the lands in which they were once held captives until Christ returns. Now until then, the children are charged to live peacefully among men and above all, turn back to the laws, statutes, and commandments as best they can. And of course, have faith in Christ. All right, well, hopefully you enjoyed the video. If so, please click like and subscribe and have a great day and Shalom.